text we're going to be covering tonight from Malachi chapter 3, and we'll be looking at um, verses 6 through 12 in this third chapter. So I invite you to follow along with me as, uh, as I read. I, the Lord, do not change, so you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you've turned away from my decrees and not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings, you are under a curse. Your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops and vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. And that uh, the reference to the Lord Almighty here, as many of you know, is a very intentional reference for uh, one of the Hebrew names of God that is used to uh, represent an aspect of God's character and God's nature, and it refers to the God who is sufficient within himself, the all-sufficient God, the one who needs nothing, the one who has everything, and uh, we'll come back to that thought here in, in just a, a few minutes. I'm going to do something very quickly that I intended to do before we got on here, and if you'll be patient with me, I'm going to open up and see if I can't post the outline for tonight in the chat. So let's see how we can do on that. Give me one moment. All right. See if it's going to let me upload this file here. I believe it will. Okay, I have dropped the uh, outline in the chat window, for those of you who might like to open it up, it's in a Word format, and if you're at a computer where you have the capability of opening that and typing in notes as we go, it's available for you. If you can see it in the chat, wave at me. Not seeing it in the chat, no. Hmm. All right, let me... Uh... Oh, I think now it's cut. Can you see it there. now? Now it's showing up. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Great. Sorry for the delay, but I'm, I'm glad you all have that. All right, so as we uh, begin with the fifth symptom tonight of a slipping heart, which we'll call uh, the tendency to defraud God, and by this point in Malachi's dialogue with the, uh, with the people of God and the nation of Israel, we're beyond tendencies. We've gotten into much more deliberate behavior and you will remember that we began our study talking about the historical context of Malachi. He's about 400, um, well, mid-4th mid century, about 450 or so 
uh, BC, give or take a decade or two. And uh, he is the last prophetic voice before Messiah. And we uh, know that the people of God had been held uh, in bondage in Assyria, the northern tribes, uh, and then uh, Judah in Babylon. Uh, the Babylonians uh, defeated the Assyrians, and so uh, the people of God were in captivity there until the Persians came and defeated the Babylonians. And um, Cyrus, the Persian king, allowed the uh, people of God, not just Israel, but uh, other conquered peoples to return to their homeland and live subservient there because he believed that uh, they would be of much better attitude, etc. This is around 539 um, BC or so when we find the temple rebuilt, the second temple built there in Jerusalem uh, under um, the oversight of uh, Ezra. Uh, Nehemiah came a little later. And so um, Malachi, we think, is, is centered in a time period about a generation or more after the rebuilding of the temple and the reinstitution of the temple practices uh, there in, in Israel, in Jerusalem. And so enough time has passed that um, the people of God have begun to be disappointed in the delay of the messianic promise. When they returned to their homeland after captivity, uh, they naturally believed and assumed that the promise of Messiah would be fulfilled within their lifetimes. Uh, very similar to what um, many of the New Testament writers felt could be the case with the uh, imminent return of Christ. But the uh, the people of God, the, the children of Israel, the descendants of Jacob, were, um, they were disillusioned. And what we call the deceptiveness of the gradual has set in. This is all under the context of, of tonight's teaching, this fifth symptom of a slipping heart. So the deceptiveness of the gradual has set in. This discouragement led to a sense of discontent then to a denial of God's faithfulness. We find that as the first symptom of the slipping heart, that the love of God was questioned back in Malachi chapter 1. A denial of God's faithfulness to diminished worship, in which um, less than acceptable sacrifices were being offered to the Lord. Then to devaluing of relationships, that third symptom of the slipping heart being the, the infidelity uh, of relationships among the people of Israel, um, their whoring after foreign gods and the, the wives that came with them and the disintegration of the marital relationship to declaring God to be unjust, which we talked about last week, that uh, the, the people of God looked at the prosperity or what they perceived to be is, is much better emphasis to put on it, the prosperity of the foreign nations and declared God not to be just. Now, as we talked last week, when we declared God to be unjust, um, we're treading on very dangerous territory because God is just um, by nature. We found the justice of God was, um, um, was, was actualized there at the cross and, and will be uh, fully realized um, in, in Jesus' return. But we're now crossing a, a bit of a threshold that once your heart, one, once a person's heart who has known God and walked with God has moved from questioning the love of God to offering God less than our best to acting without integrity in our relationships and then moving into a place of actual accusation against God, the, the end result of that is a much more intentional um, defrauding of God. It's very interesting that in the early part of Malachi, we saw the people of God offering to God less than their best. Now, as we come to this fifth symptom of the slipping heart, we find the people of God offering God nothing at all. And uh, we find that Israel has started to hold out on God. 
and we're going to be looking at that tonight in, in some detail. Um, have you ever seen a congregation of people that start holding out as a means of exercising control or voicing uh, a sense of discontent or rebellion? Um, I've seen it in ministry leadership within the annual conference as a United Methodist. It happens in all kinds of churches, unfortunately, that when it comes time for some powerful lay people to begin to feel it's time for the pastor to move on, what do they do? Well, they withhold their giving because they want to get uh, they want to get the authorities' attention that this can't go on. Something has to change. And in some ways, we find the people of Israel here in the book of Malachi reflecting this kind of attitude toward toward the Lord. They have begun to hold out on the Lord, almost like a, an adolescent or a, even a toddler who stamps their feet and says, you're not the boss of me anymore. And um, so they are beginning to withhold from God, not just giving to God less than their best, but now they have progressed to a point of defrauding the Lord. And this is what Malachi addresses here in chapter 3 and uh, verses 6 through 12. Now, I do need to add a little bit of an aside here. Historically, prior to Malachi, during the time of Nehemiah, if we have this dated correctly, would have been a generation or so, maybe two before Malachi, we find one of the primary themes in the book of Nehemiah is Nehemiah confronting the people of God on their having withheld the tithe from the Lord. And we find in Nehemiah chapter 13, particularly in verse 12, the tithe being reinstated after they've come back and they've built the second temple. Now, what we don't know for certain, I'm going to speculate just a minute tonight, but what we don't know for certain is that when Malachi addresses the withholding of the tithe or the defrauding of God or the holding out on God here in this third chapter, whether this is um, a part of what Nehemiah addressed or whether we have a further backsliding among the people. And I'm going to suggest that what we're seeing since we're a generation or two removed, is now a further backsliding. We have, we have the people of God once again uh, denying God the tithe. Now, in Nehemiah's case, it was more procedural. In this case, it reads as being more personal. And again, if you, if you watch the progression of what happens to a heart when it begins to question God's faithfulness, and it goes down this slippery slope of decline, we reach this place where we become intentional in our, uh, in our withholding ourselves from the Lord. Uh, whether that's a, a matter of saying we can do things better than God can, or whether we're um, amassing our resources um, as a, a means of hedging ourselves against God's faith, faithlessness, um, whichever is the case, um, it can happen. It can happen to us. And I suspect there's some of us, if we're very honest, will say at some point in our lives, it has happened to us. And it is a clear telltale sign of a heart that has now moved a great distance from its relationship to the Lord. And we see the Lord addressing that, don't we, right here in Malachi 3, where he says, return to me and I'll return to you. So what is God's plea? This is the second section here on our notes. What is God's plea to Israel? Well, it's three or four fold. The first is God is going to, to plead with Israel about his immutability. God says, I don't change. But what we find here in Malachi 3 and verse 6 is not only does God not change, but God charges Israel with not having changed. And we see um, as the Lord opens this part of the dialogue through Malachi, he says, I, the Lord, do not change. So you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. In other words, God is saying to them, it's a good thing for you that I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's a good, it's a good thing for you that my hesed, my faithfulness holds. God says, otherwise you would, um, you would have met with absolute destruction. Now, they've already been brought back from discipline, but God says, I have withheld destruction from you um, because of my faithfulness, that faithfulness you questioned all the way back there in chapter 1 and verse 2 when you said, oh yeah, God, how have you loved us? 
that faithfulness has kept you from destruction. I don't know about you, but I'm so thankful for those seasons in my life when the faithfulness of God has kept me from what I deserved. And this is what the Lord is reminding the, uh, the people of Israel about. Now, it's interesting here that he refers to them in verse 6 of Malachi 3 as the descendants of Jacob. Now, we all remember that back in Genesis uh, chapter 32 and beyond to about chapter 35 there, where the Lord changes Jacob's name to Israel. And in changing Jacob's name to Israel, uh, the Lord also changes Jacob's character from a deceiver and a supplanter to um, one who will be the father of the 12 tribes uh, of Israel. And, and so very often in the Old Testament, most often the people of God are referred to as the children of Israel or the descendants of Israel, uh, and less so the descendants of Jacob. So we're left to wonder what the Lord is doing here through Malachi when he refers to them as um, I do not change. That's why you haven't been destroyed, you descendants of Jacob. Is this a backhanded referral to Israel, um, Jacob, before his transformation and a reference to uh, essentially the, the failure of the people of Israel to transform as God intended of them? Or is it a reference to Jacob's promise to follow and obey God in Genesis 32, 28, and if you remember that text, you remember that uh, Jacob, having experienced a time of, of doubting the Lord, comes back and says, God, if you will be faithful to me, I will give to you 10% of all that I have. So Jacob makes the, um, the offer to God of the tithe. Now, this is interesting because it's before the law, and we'll come to that in just a few minutes. But I just find, without really giving an answer to that question, I find it to be intriguing that the Lord addresses the people of Israel in the way he does here. Um, it may even be a bit of, of, uh, uh, of godly sarcasm. We're not, we're not quite sure, but he is referencing Israel's uh, unfaithfulness. And so when we have here God's declaration that he doesn't change, we also see God's declaration in Genesis 3 or in Malachi 3, 6, that the people of God haven't changed either, and, and that's not a compliment. In verse 7, he says, ever since the time of your ancestors, you've turned away from my decrees, and you've not kept them. And then the Lord says, return to me, and I will return to you. So that's the second part of God's plea here. Return to me, and I'll return to you. Now, we see here in this seventh verse, um, actually, two representations, or, or really verse 7 and 8, two representations of this style of dialogue that Malachi and the people of God are engaged in here in the prophecy, where Malachi will make a statement in the name of the Lord or ask a question in the name of the Lord, and the people will respond back. Who? Us? There's this uh, incredulousness, incredulity in the people that, that they would be under this charge. And so when, when Malachi speaks and says to them, return to me, says the Lord, and I'll return to you, the people very typically respond, well, how shall we return? How are we to return? The New Living Translation, which a few of our uh, friends at FAS were very involved in the uh, uh, in that particular translation, Vic Hamilton, I believe, I know John Oswalt was with Isaiah, and maybe Lawson Stone as well, but uh, in the New Living Translation, I, I love the way it puts it when it says, how can we return when we've never gone away? In other words, their response to God is, God, we hadn't gone anywhere. And there almost seems to be, perhaps I'm reading into it, but there almost seems to be an, um, a nonverbal complaint against God that if someone's moved, it's you. And again, we're finding the, the people of God getting into a very, very dangerous place here of accusation against the Lord. We've moved from, you know, their inability to see their condition, their lack of self-awareness, to actually a state of complaint against God, which started back uh, earlier in this chapter, in the end of chapter 2, when they're 
accusing God of, of lacking a sense of justice. And, and we see that beginning to creep in here. How can we return when we've never gone away? Now, as I was thinking about this today, just in praying and preparing for tonight, I was thinking about kind of, I guess, the analogy of two people living in a house who are no longer in love. Now, the analogy breaks down because God's still in love with Israel, despite Israel's unfaithfulness, but, but Israel is no longer in love with God at this point. And you have two partners with a long history who are living in the same house. Neither one of them have moved anywhere, but they're miles apart. And this is the state of their relationship. And so the Lord challenges Israel and says, if you'll come back to me, I'll come back to you. You can hear the plea of a lover there who not only is scorned, but a lover who's brokenhearted, who, who wants above everything the restoration of that relationship and calls Israel to repentance. Now, the, the term to come back or return is the same term in the Hebrew from which we would get the Hebrew concept of repentance. So the Lord says, repent, and I will return to you. In this case, we see that repentance is more than just um, doing better. It's more than just making a decision to do differently. We get the sense in this text that it is just as much an act of restoring a relationship that has been broken. And we've talked about this many times, sometimes neglected in our, in our holiness world, but the fact that when we break a law, when we break a rule, we're breaking a heart because the law is a reflection of, God, of what God loves. The law is a reflection of what God values. And so therefore, when we violate God's law, in this case, the charge and the complaint that God has against the people we're going to address here in um, just a moment, we're also breaking God's heart. So you, you hear the voice, you hear the impassioned plea of God saying, return to me and I'll return to you. In other words, um, I haven't gone anywhere and I'm only one step away. Isn't that the beautiful thing about God's grace? I think of the prodigal son who went to that far country, and yet when he took that first step out of the pig pen, rehearsing his line, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no more, no more worthy to be called your son. With that first step, he was already home. The father was already looking for him. Father was already waiting for him. Father was ready to receive him. And it's a beautiful thing about grace that no matter how far we get from God, we're only one step away. It's that step of repentance that uh, God hasn't moved. We have. And um, repentance is that one step, that one, uh, that one act of confession, of agreeing with God's charge against us. And so the Lord says, if you will return to me, I will return to you uh, here in, in Malachi 3, 7. We find that in most cases throughout the Old Testament, when the prophets speak and they issue a call to repentance to the people of God, it is usually accompanied by what the Germans would call a heilswort or a word of salvation. God says, if you will turn back to me, I will do this. If you will repent, I will do this. I will restore your fortunes. I will give back to you the years that the locusts and the canker worms ate away, um, so on and so forth, we find throughout the, um, the Old Testament in this relationship of, of people who are constantly turning their back on God, turning away from God, turning to idols, and, and coming back to Him and finding restoration. Now, we know the ultimate um, restoration for, for Israel was to be found in the coming of Messiah, but we find a very patient, a very loving, a very gracious God. So the, the third aspect of um, God's uh, charge here against uh, Israel, or God's plea, is this, will a mere mortal rob God? I love that question. Um, is, a, is a mere human capable of robbing God? I mean, is God's house so insecure 
And I mean that from a security standpoint. Is God's house so insecure that someone could scale the wall and break in, that someone could pick the lock, that someone could enter in to God's place of residence when God is asleep, though we know he never sleeps or slumbers. But here's the analogy being given. Is it possible for a mortal, for a human, to rob God? What would we say? Well, the obviously the, the inference, the rhetorical aspect of this question is yes. The word rob in the Hebrew, very interesting word. It means to seize or to take away. Um, it also can be translated and is, is translated in the Old Testament to mean to plunder, to plunder. The Septuagint, the Greek version of the Old Testament, um, used the word pertinizo uh, or to deceive. That's why I'm talking about this symptom of a slipping heart being referred to as defrauding God, that we think we're deceiving God when we hold out on him that we are seizing or taking away that which belongs to him. Is it possible for us to do that? Well, again, the, the inference is yes. We read here in, um, again, in chapter 3 and verse 8, will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me, says the Lord. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and in offerings. Now, Israel was under a curse. We've talked about the fact that the, the insects were eating their crops. This was much of, of the reason um, why the people would look at foreign nations and say they're blessed while we're cursed, that God is not fair, God is not just, the wicked prosper while, uh, while we are, are living um, in, um, in a time of, of destitution. But the Lord makes it very quick in the Old Testament to remind us that when we find ourselves in those seasons, that we have no farther to look than ourselves. Now, certainly, we're all subject to, to uh, the weather, and we're subject to, to calamity and to tragedy. But I, I love this verse from Haggai, the prophet, chapter 1 and verse 6, when he says this, see if it may describe your life or at least perhaps your life at some given time. I know it did mine before I began to take this issue of, of robbing God through tithes and offerings seriously. It says in Haggai 1.6, you have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. Think about that statement. Have you ever put a handful of change in a pocket and felt it run down your leg? Have you ever felt like you were taking your paycheck and putting it, up, putting it in your pocket and having it run down your leg? That no matter what, no matter how hard we work, no matter what we make, and no matter what we try to do to supply for ourselves, we always seem to come up short. Well, perhaps that's a good part of the problem, isn't it? And what we find with Israel, and God's complaint against Israel, is that, that the calamity they were facing only became an excuse for them. The curse they were under, which was because of their unfaithfulness, only became an excuse to further hold out on God. You see, when we're under a curse, it's easy to claim we can't give because we can't afford it. Now, here's a spiritual reality as much as it's a life reality. We can't dig ourselves out of poverty but we can give ourselves out of poverty. You know, you've heard maybe poverty is not the right word. Maybe calamity is the right word. But, but you know, you've all heard the statement that uh, when you find yourself in a deep hole, what's the first thing you do? Well, number one, you just stop digging. <laughs> Don't make it worse. And, uh, and so we can't dig ourselves out of a bad place, especially a place that is largely a result of our own stinginess, our own self-sufficiency, our holding out on God because we believe that God is not for us. Why give to a God that isn't for me? Why give to a God that isn't going to be faithful to me? Well, the first thing we have to do is stop digging, and in God's economy, the way out is to start giving. You see, Israel's lack of faithfulness to God was really not their problem. 
Um, but it was a symptom of a much deeper problem. This fifth symptom, the slipping heart, which is a heart that is now full of deceit, a heart that has made judgment against God. And because of that judgment does not see God worthy of Israel's tithe and offering. So I'm going to make this statement. I put it in bold print in my notes. It's not on yours, but you may want to write it down. A Christian holding on to money is always a sign of a Christian holding out on God. Now, we can discuss that when we're finished tonight, if you want to ask questions or dispute that. But uh, I'm going to stand by this statement. A Christian holding on to money is always a sign of a Christian holding out on God. At least this was true in Israel. And um, we read in Matthew 6, 19, 21, do not store up for yourselves. That's the key phrase, for yourselves, self-sufficiency. Um, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break up, break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Um, Kim and I like sometimes to watch uh, crime dramas and mysteries when I'm home at night on television. And there's that line that always seems to crop up, right? Follow the money. Follow the money. Well, I think God could say the same thing oftentimes about us. Follow the money. There's a great story about Sam Houston, the, uh, the Texan and the Patriot. And um, he... Uh, came to Christ, and he, he got gloriously saved, and he was being baptized. And when old Sam Houston went down into the water to be baptized, somebody noticed that he had his wallet, or at least his, uh, his rubber band around his cash that was in his pocket, and said, Sam, wait a minute, you need to take your wallet out of your pocket. And he turned and said, nope, my wallet needs to be baptized too. <laughs> Sam Houston knew that when we come to God, that God gets all of us. Um, and I thought that was a, that's, a, that's a great story that uh, uh, emphasizes that truth. So Israel is holding out on God in tithes and offerings. So let's talk about the tithe. Let's talk about the offerings from both an Old Testament and a New Testament perspective. So first of all, we're going to take a look at the nature of Old Testament tithing. The Lord charges Israel of holding out, defrauding God, keeping what belongs to the Lord um, by holding on to the tithe and the offering. Now, the word tithe simply means tenth. We know that. And there were occasions in Israel when the Lord called for a tenth of what the people had. Um, in Leviticus 27, in verse 30, um, the law says the tithe belongs to the Lord and is holy unto the Lord. And, and the term holy there meaning to be set apart. So the tithe is the Lord's and is to be set apart for him. Um, of course, we know that um, in the Psalms, we read that uh, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The Lord owns everything. But what the Lord asked from Israel was a tenth. Now, the irony of this is that that was not an uncommon practice, even in the pagan world. The Canaanites and the Phoenicians and the Carthaginians and the Greeks and the Romans uh, all required something similar to a tithe from their people. By the time we get to the Greeks and the Romans, it's almost more of a political tax. But this concept of the tithe was not unique to the people of God, to the Jewish nation. But the Lord said the tithe belongs to him and is to be set apart for him. And it was called for at various times of the year. Um, annually, the, uh, well, I'll come, I'll come to that in a minute. Let me first of all state, though, that we have an interesting, um, an interesting dynamic that's true here in Israel, and that is that the tithe precedes the law. In Genesis 14, we find the account of Abraham and Melchizedek in the giving of 10% as a gift or a tithe, unsolicited. But there must surely have been some expectation there in the culture 
In Genesis 28, we referenced it a little while ago. In verse 32, we find Jacob pledging to give God 10% of all that he had, ironically conditional upon God's faithfulness to him. Um, I suspect God laughed a little at that one, but nonetheless, Jacob made that, uh, made that commitment to the Lord. This is before the law has been given or instituted. Um, annually in Israel, we find that there were um, at least three occasions um, or three purposes, let's say, for the tithe and the offering. There was the annual tithe we find recorded in Deuteronomy 14, which was generally for the benefit of the priests. A person would bring a grain offering or they might uh, bring a, an offering of an animal, a third of which would be uh, flayed and uh, given to the priest for food, a third of which would be taken home for the individual that brought it, and a third would be burned before the Lord. Um, so we find grain offerings, and we find animal offerings. We find other kinds of tithes and offerings that are given um, ceremonially at certain times of the year, uh, at festival time. There's a triennial tithe once every three years, also recorded in Deuteronomy 14, for the poor. So we have the one tithe that's generally for the purpose of the priests and their sustenance. That's what we call the storehouse. And uh, then we find the um, every third year tithe for the benefit of the poor and the needy. And then there were also offerings that were set aside for special purposes. At various times, offerings would be called for or would be part of ceremonial uh, occasions, and they would be used primarily for the sanctuary, whether that would have been for the building of the tabernacle, uh, on the wilderness journey in the Old Testament, or whether it would have been for the building of the temple or for other kinds of um, structural uh, kinds of, of things. So you find these three purposes, the tithe for the benefit of the priests and their sustenance for the poor, and then also for the infrastructure of building in Israel. Now, here's where it gets a little tricky because while the, while the word tithe means tenth, um, based on the best scholarship we, we have, and there's been some dispute about this, but uh, many scholars would indicate that the average Jew in the Old Testament, the average Hebrew, actually, when you calculate the number of all of these different tithes and offerings, would have given somewhere in the neighborhood of 23% of their annual income to the Lord. So while the word tithe means tenth, the way that tithe is taken, distributed, and the timing of it um, really amounts to, to a bit more than that. So that's the Old Testament tithe, and it's commanded of the Lord, it belongs to him, it's holy to him, so it's to be set apart. We also have this dynamic of the, of the tithe preceding the law. So what does that mean when it comes to the New Testament? Because the New Testament makes no mention whatsoever of the tithe, other than Matthew 23, when Jesus is um, confronting the Pharisees, and he talks about the different things that they had been doing, including tithing. And he says, you have done well. Now, of course, we recognize that Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees before his crucifixion and resurrection, before the covenant of law has been replaced or um, um, exceeded by a covenant of grace. So when we come to the New Testament, what are we to... Um, uh, to really discern about the nature of tithing in the New Testament. We not only don't have evidence of the tithe in the New Testament, we have many New Testament scholars who say there is, um, um, there is no reference in early Christian history in the first century or two of the practice of tithing, certainly not being mandated and uh, generally not being practiced in the New Testament church. So how, how do we translate this issue of the law of the tithe in the Old Testament? Or if you prefer to refer to it as the principle of the tithe, that the children of God were withholding from him, um, how do we interpret this withholding in a New Testament context if we're not under the law of the tithe? Um, we're not under obligation, but here's a principle that we ought to always keep in mind. Grace never expects less than law and always demands more. 
Now, I'm not suggesting that we're obligated to give 23% or more of our income to the Lord. That's not the point. But the point is our giving in the new covenant is for an entirely different reason than our giving in the old covenant. The law was given as a foreshadowing of Christ. The law was given to point to Christ. But once Christ has come, we now look back at what Jesus did on the cross and in the resurrection, and we give for a different reason, not because we're obligated, but because of grace. And grace always asks more of us than the law requires, such as in the case of the tithe. In the Old Testament, though God owned everything, he required only 10 percent, or 23, if we want to look at it that way, from, from his people in terms of their giving. In the New Testament, God demands everything from us. God requires 100% of our lives. And so the question no longer becomes under grace, what must I give? The question becomes, what can I keep? Because under the New Testament, we're no longer giving out of obligation, but we see our lives as stewards of what belongs to the Lord. So let's go back and, and look at one place in the New Testament where we find the most explicit instruction given to how the people of God are to give. It's in 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. Now, I'm not going to go through those texts, but I do want to call your attention to them and invite you to read them, and I will uh, appeal to one of those verses in a minute because it's the critical verse in those two chapters, the last verse um, ironically, in 2 Corinthians 9. So in chapters 8 and 9, we find Paul appealing to the Corinthian believers to participate in an offering that he is coming to receive or will be received for the Jerusalem Christians who are in poverty. And he talks about in chapter 8 the believers in Macedonia who had already given and had given out of their own sense of need and their own poverty. The Corinthians were in a different place. They had more to give. And so Paul is appealing to them to follow the example of the Macedonians. And I love some of the, the verbiage that Paul uses in 2 Corinthians 8 when he, he talks about they pled for the privilege of giving to the, to the Christians in Jerusalem. How many of you know people in your church who plead for the privilege of giving? Um, oftentimes, the, the most tolerated portion of our year in a local church is the stewardship campaign. God help us. It should never be that way. But Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 8, referring to the Macedonians, that they, they pleaded for the privilege of giving and gave generously of themselves. And then we get into chapter 9 of 2 Corinthians, where Paul gives explicit instructions about how the Corinthians are to prepare to receive their offering for the brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. And he says, to, um, to determine what you will give, to be deliberate. Don't just reach in your pocket and decide what you're going to give when the plate comes by. Be deliberate about it. Be determined to give something. Now, he doesn't tell them what to give, and he doesn't tell them to tithe, and he doesn't tell them what the amount of the offering ought to be. Now, as pastors, <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you, as pastors, we like the tithe in the New Testament sense because it gives us at least some mechanism to control our people on what we think they ought to be giving. It's, a, um, it's, a, uh, it's an ominous thing to realize that under grace, people can make their own choices. But what Paul does say is be deliberate, be intentional, determine what you're going to give, and he tells them, if you give in small amounts, you'll reap in small amounts. And if you give in large amounts, you'll reap in large amounts. That principle is there. It's not a quid pro quo. It's not you give a lot to God, and God's obligated to give you a brand new brand new Cadillac and a five-bedroom house and, and uh, all of that. I'll be in Mexico in just over a week uh, preaching pastor's conferences in three cities and having the privilege of teaching at Simbamex, the OMS seminary there. We were with those leaders uh, a year ago. They came from all over Mexico, and now we're going to their cities to uh, uh, reach beyond them to their neighbors and others who will, will come and will have an opportunity to meet. Jim Harriman and I will be, uh, will be leading that mission. We're very excited about it. 
because the people in Mexico, our, our Wesleyan leaders there, tell us they get no teaching on biblical holiness. That essentially anything related to holiness is, is in Mexico is really related to Pentecostalism, and you get a mixture of voodoo Catholicism and, um, um, and, and Pentecostal health, wealth, and prosperity. So it, it's an incredible opportunity for us to teach bedrock biblical truth about a life that's fully surrendered to the Lord and what we can expect from God as a result. Now, again, that is not a transactional experience. It's an experience of giving out of gratitude and finding a God whom we can't outgive, whether God gives that back in material resources or whether God gives it back in spiritual prosperity um, is not to be dictated to the Lord, but to be received with gratitude. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, we find what Paul says to the Corinthian believers about how to go about making that offering. And then he finishes it with 2 Corinthians 9, 15. So the 8th and the ninth chapters of 2 Corinthians receive an exclamation point on the end. Verse 15 of 2 Corinthians 9 says, and thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. You see, that's the why for our giving. It's uh, whether it's tithing, whether it's offerings, whatever we determine purpose in our heart to give because of our gratitude to God. And I would again say to you, why would we give less under grace when God owns everything and we're the steward than an Old Testament um, child of God, uh, children of Israel? Why they would give under compulsion by law? Why would we give less under grace than they would be compelled to give? Um, but no matter the amount, we give because of God giving to us. The basis of our giving is our gratitude for what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. So in the New Testament sense, if our heart begins to slip away from God and we begin to hold out on him, it's because we've lost sight of his grace. Now, folks, it's possible to give without worship. We can give out of obligation. We can give out of duty and not be worshiping God in our giving. That was very true of the people of Israel here in Malachi's time. But according to Paul in Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to the Lord, which is your reasonable service of worship. It is not possible to worship without giving. We can give without worship, but we can't worship without giving. And um, so to give in the New Testament sense is not an obligation. It's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to surrender our hold on material possessions. It's an opportunity to trust God as our source. And it's an opportunity to worship God with our lives. Now, I'd like to share with you um, a process that really all three of the churches that I served as a pastor began to work with when it came to financial stewardship. Um, many of us during the years in our, in our stewardship have, you know, had stewardship campaigns, pledge campaigns to raise money for our budgets. I never liked the word budget. Budget's a household term. It's a business term. It's a corporate term. In the church, a budget ought to be a ministry investment plan or a ministry action plan and ought to be aligned with our mission, vision, and values. And, um, and so I began to become very distressed as a pastor about the way we went about giving as a church, that uh, we would read a bunch of these scriptures on biblical giving, we would emphasize tithing, and we would hedge it, hand out a pledge card and ask people to give to the church so that we knew how much to prepare to spend on the Lord's work. Well, as I went to 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9, um, I worked with some of our leaders in the first church I served to come up with an experiment. We decided we would do it one time and see what happened. And uh, we dismissed the pledge campaign, but we did a two-week devotional before what we called a Celebrate Giving Sunday in the fall. And on that Celebrate Giving Sunday, and in the two weeks leading up to it, people did devotionals that we wrote. They would... Um, uh, have guided prayers and guided study times about biblical stewardship, which, which went beyond just giving, um, but about the stewardship of our lives, time, talent, and treasures. But let me stop here and say this. 
when somebody says to you, well, you know, the Bible says that giving's more than about money. It's also about your talent and your time. You're usually listening to somebody who doesn't want to give their money, but they're perfectly willing to give their talent and give their time because money's the last thing we hold on to, isn't it? And, uh, and so we did a two week devotional. And when it came time for the quote commitment Sunday or the celebrate giving Sunday, uh, people received envelopes in the mail that they could use for, for their pledge, but it was not a pledge to the church. Uh, they received an envelope and in that envelope were two cards. The cards were identical. They would fill one card out and put it in the envelope. They would fill the other card out and put it where they paid their bills as a reminder that they had made not a pledge to the church, but they had entered into a covenant with the Lord because during those two weeks, we were challenging people to, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 9, purpose in your heart what you will give. They could purpose in a dollar amount. They could purpose in a percentage of their income. And, uh, and those Celebrate Giving Sundays were sacred. So we tried it the first time and we had people come and they put their card in the envelope, they sealed the envelope, and they wrote their name on the outside of the envelope. And our promise to them was, we will never open your envelope. We're not going to budget on the basis of what you've pledged to the church because you haven't pledged. Anybody can do a three-year rolling average and budget by it. Um, that doesn't take a whole lot of mathematics. And so um, we divorced our, our ministry investment planning from the Celebrate Giving Sundays because we, what we wanted people doing is celebrating their giving because they were celebrating the giving of God to them, and we wanted them to give accordingly. And that covenant and that pledge was not to the church. It was between them and the Lord and the Lord alone. So we promised we'd never look in the envelopes. We wouldn't hold them up to the light. Um, they would be put in a drawer, locked, and kept in a very safe place until six months later we did it again. And when we did it again, the next time they received not only the two uh, cards and a fresh envelope, but they also received the envelope that they had written their name on the last time. So they could open it up as a part of their two-week preparation for the next Celebrate Giving Sunday to have a time of evaluating their faithfulness to God, their commitment to the covenant, and celebrating God's faithfulness to them during that six-month period. And we saw it absolutely revolutionize the finances of all three of those churches. And so if you're looking for a way to maybe do stewardship in a little different fashion, then, then I hope you'll, uh, you'll maybe give that some thought. So we're going to finish up here now with this last section of God's challenge to Israel. Now, it's an interesting challenge because we find that the Lord says in the Old Testament that his people are never to put him to the test. And yet we find God challenging Israel on this occasion to put him to the test here in Malachi chapter 3 and uh, verse 10. Bring the whole tithe. Now, what does he mean by the whole tithe? Uh, I think God is saying, bring to me not only your tithe, but bring to me what you've held out on me. Uh, pay up. Now, that's an act of repentance. Uh, repentance always requires restoration. And so the Lord says, bring all the tithe into the storehouse. What's the storehouse? It was that, that room or that place. We don't know exactly where it was located. Was it in the temple? Was it a, a, an adjacent structure? But it was a, a place where um, those goods were kept, the grain was kept um, in, in order to be used by the priests. Bring it all into the storehouse, that which will feed the poor, that which will feed the priests. Uh, bring it to me, the Lord says, and test me in this, he says in verse 10. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Now, God is challenging Israel. Put me to the test. Give the whole tithe. That was my challenge to the first church when we went with the, uh, the, the, the envelope uh, exchange from the, the pledge to the covenant. Because I said, you know what? If we're not better off six months from now than we are right now out of this act of obedience to the Lord, I'll be willing to let our finance committee go back and do it the old rusty way they're used to doing it that people complain about every year in the fall for six weeks. And uh, instead, we had about a 50% increase in giving. And again, I'm convinced it was because we tied giving to our gratitude for what God has done for us in Jesus. And so God says, repent, bring the tithe into the storehouse, and test me to see 
if I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing so that you don't even have room to store it. Now, I love this word that's used in the Hebrew here in Malachi 3 in verse 10, where it says, I'll open the floodgates. It's the same word used in Genesis chapter 7, verse 11, where God says, I'm opening up heaven to flood the earth. And we know what happened there. That's the image, the, uh, the overflow of the flooding, uh, where God covers and encompasses everything in our lives with his blessing. He says, I will rebuke the devourer for you. That's the really the, the more King James language of it, but I like that language. But in the, in the New International, chapter 3 and verse 11, he says, I'll prevent pests from devouring your crops. The vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord. So God says, I will cause your crops to be fruitful. What a promise, because that was not the case in Israel at the time. And the Lord says, if you will test me in this, see what I will do for you. Now, I have the privilege of teaching in the course of study program uh, in the Global Methodist Church with students that are at Wesley Biblical Seminary. And I teach a class on uh, church administration and finance. How, how exciting, right? Well, my students actually seem to love it, um, partially because we're, we're approaching this thing from the perspective we're talking about tonight. Um, and I have a student who's an attorney. I won't mention his name, but he was an attorney who was somewhat successful and said he had achieved everything he'd ever wanted in life and was serving his church as the chair of every committee in the life of the church, trying to pay God back and fighting the whole time a call upon his life to the ministry. And so uh, in his uh, late 40s, he made a commitment to the Lord to give up his law practice and to go into ministry. And he's now getting his course of study um, certificate while pastoring a church in, uh, in the global Methodist uh, denomination. But he said an interesting thing to us the other day in our Zoom call, and he was not bragging. It was with great humility that he talked about this, but he said how the Lord challenged him to test him and to find God faithful. As an attorney, he tithed off his lawyer's income. Um, and um, when he made his commitment to Christ for ministry, he also made the pledge to the Lord that he would continue, no matter what he made as a pastor, he would continue to tithe off the highest income he had ever received in his professional life. You see, he tested God. And, and as, he, as he talked about that the other day, the light in his eyes, the joy in his countenance, the blessing he's receiving from the Lord. He didn't attach that to material things. Um, but the sense of freedom from the bondage to material possessions and to wealth has liberated him. And uh, the Lord is rebuking the devourer for him. The Lord is making things go further. The Lord's multiplying loaves and fishes. And he's testifying to that. What a, what a great blessing. And then it says also here, um, the Lord says to through Malachi, then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land. Now, the translation of that actually means all the nations will call you, cause you blessed because the Lord will be delighted with you in the land. Folks, um, there's a whole lot more joy in walking with the Lord when the Lord is delighted in us than there is in trying to walk with the Lord out of duty and obligation um, when we're just trying to keep the rules, or certainly when we're being chastised or rebuked by the Lord for our faithlessness, that uh, there's nothing in our lives, we've all experienced it. Maybe we're not experiencing it now. Maybe we need to retrace our steps through Malachi to where we allowed our heart to slip. But we've all encountered that experience of being in that sweet spot with the Lord, where nothing is held back from God, and God holds nothing back from us. And uh, it's a delightful place to be. And um, Israel has had in its 
last generations, its last several hundred years, a reputation for being idolaters and a reputation for being unfaithful to God and a reputation for being a scorn of the earth and a reputation of being subservient to other nations. And God says, if you will be faithful to me, I will make you a blessing. And how this harkens back, doesn't it? I found it very ironic today as I was preparing for tonight, and we'll end with this, but I, I found it very ironic that when God speaks to Abraham in Genesis 12, when he calls him from Ur the Chaldees, a man who does not yet even know God, um, full of material possessions. And the Lord says to Abraham, Abraham, lay it down for me and go with me to a place I'll show you. And look up to the stars of the heaven. I will make your seed as bountiful as these stars. And through you, every nation of the earth will be blessed. That's the beginning of the covenant. And here we find Malachi 400 years before the fulfillment of that covenant in Jesus Christ, the last word of God through the prophet in the Old Testament reminding the people of God of that promise to be a blessing to all nations. That's God's covenant. That's God's promise to them. And it's a conditional promise, um, but it is God's promise. If they will be faithful to him, if they will bring the tithe to the storehouse, that God will unlock his blessings from heaven in fact, it says, I will empty out. Um, isn't it interesting, the, the metaphor God uses of emptying heaven in order to fill our storehouses so full there's not enough room to keep the blessings of God. And, uh, and so, as we think about our own lives tonight, we think about the progression of the gradual, the deceptiveness of the gradual, how we can so easily move from... Um, challenging God's faithfulness to us, to giving to God less than our best, to um, a lack of integrity in our relationships, particularly our relationship with God and having that reflected in every other relationship of our life, on to declaring God to be unjust and unfair. God's holding out on us, and because God's holding out on us, we're going to hold out on Him. If we find ourselves in that progression, what a great opportunity for us to stop return to the Lord who hasn't left us, and uh, to offer our word of confession and repentance and our act of repentance by giving back to God what is His. And uh, I pray that we'll do that tonight. Let me have a quick prayer for you, and then we'll open it up for any questions before we close. Lord God, I, I thank you tonight for this time together. Thank you again for this technology. Um, thank you for showing me a way to look directly into the camera. <laughs> that matters. I thank you for our dear friends, Lord, who are who are online tonight. And uh, we are all capable. Uh, we are all capable, Lord, when we yield to self-interest and self-sufficiency to allowing our hearts to slip away from you. And uh, we hear your words saying to us tonight, return to me and I'll return to you. Lord, in whatever place we've left you or turned aside from you, even for a moment, we, we want to give you our full attention. We want to return our hearts to you. We want to repent. If that means bringing tithes to the storehouse we've held back from you, if it, if it means giving to you our, our career, uh, the grain that we earn, that we thought is, is ours, that church is one world and our work is another world, that, Lord, you want all of our worlds. Um, whatever that may mean tonight, that, that we bring to you what's yours, um, that we empty our hearts and we empty our lives of self so that we can be filled with the fullness of God so that there's not room enough in us to contain all of the God that you want to live inside of us and to empower us by your Holy Spirit. We give you thanks. Lord, may we be found trustworthy in that which belongs to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.